Thank you for joining us for today's Avacta webinar, The Pruritic Horse Approach and Treatment. I'm delighted to welcome to Webinar Club our speaker for today, Professor Stephen White. Thank you, Professor White. I'm now going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Sammy Jo. I uh, very much appreciate uh, this uh, opportunity to talk to everyone, and I do want to thank uh, the uh, Avecta Animal Health people for sponsoring this uh, presentation. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about paritis in the horse and the main things that that uh, can cause it and how some and I hope a lot of practical things for the practitioner as well as to how to approach these horses. So we'll go ahead and get started and um, there we go. Okay, so when we talk about paritis, we have to first talk about allergies. I think most of us in veterinary school, when we talked about paritis in horses, it was something of a review of our parasitology classes. And certainly parasites are an important, uh, an important uh, reason for having paritis in the horse. But I think that other allergies, other allergic stimuli are also out there and are becoming more and more recognized. So I'm going to dwell on that first and then we'll talk about some parasites. So the, the three uh, allergies that we talk about in almost all our domestic species are atopic dermatitis, uh, contact dermatitis, and food allergy. Food allergy being rather rare in the horse, despite various things on the in the public domain or on the web. We're going to talk mainly about atopic dermatitis, and we're going to go ahead and, and uh, uh, explore that a little bit more as to what exactly is atopic dermatitis. The best way of thinking about atopic dermatitis is that it's an allergic reaction to environmental antigens. And when I talk to horse owners, the way I explain this is it's somewhat similar to people who have hay fever. And of course, in, with hay fever, with people, especially in the spring with pollen or in the, uh, in the fall with ragweed uh, allergies. Uh, our major problems are drippy eyes and drippy noses, and the, the respiratory tract. In horses, uh, there is some evidence to show that certainly horses will have problems with their respiratory tract, but perhaps the main target organ is in fact the skin. And this uh, reaction is mediated by IgE antibodies, which most of us learned about in veterinary school, and that the IgE antibodies um, are basically, I, we always thought of it as IgE being the evil antibody. Uh, and these would sit on mast cells, and if they were sensitized and the allergen came along, they would grab hold of the allergen, and once two or more of these on a mast cell grabbed hold of them, this would alter the structure of the mast cell, and it would begin to spew out various inflammatory products. And, but what we also know is that there seems to be barrier dysfunction, and that is to say the stratum corneum, that very top layer of the skin in horses that are atopic, doesn't function as well as it does in horses that aren't. And what that means is it's kind of leaky, and it's easier for things like bacteria and various pollens and various other uh, environmental uh, antigens to penetrate that barrier and set off the immune response. And um, even, even beyond that, uh, when, we, um, uh, when we talk about atopic dermatitis, we talk about pollens and molds, and there's a little uh, electron microscopy uh, photo or photo micrograph of uh, a storage mite, which are also dust and storage mites, are ubiquitous in the environment unless you're living in Antarctica. And so horses are constantly being exposed to these products. And um, whether it's during the warm weather and it's primarily pollens, or whether it's in the cold weather where it's things like molds and uh, various uh, storage and dust mites, uh, or whether it's year-round and the animals are exposed to all of these, uh, the clinical signs are often very much the same. So these allergens, how do they gain 
uh, how do they set off the uh, initial allergic response? Because some of some of the uh, uh, some of the way that they do this is uh, being looked at, and in fact, even being utilized as there in in regards to how we can uh, how we can mobilize various therapeutic uh, possibilities. So, in in atopic dermatitis, the allergens tend to gain entrance right through that leaky stratum corneum. It's a percutaneous uh, way of uh, entering the body, if you will. And again, as I said before, the allergens bind to the sensitized IgE on the mast cell. They cause degranulation and release of inflammatory substances. What is also known now is that not only the mast cells, but even as these, uh, uh, these antigens, if you will, as they, as they migrate through the epidermis, that top layer of the skin, they will set off allergic responses, or if you will, immunologic responses of the epidermal cells themselves will start producing inflammatory substances. So of course, all of these inflammatory substances um, are the uh, initiators of uh, the pruritus that we see. So uh, as you might expect with pruritus in any species, and certainly in the horse, uh, this creates alopecia because the hair loss from the scratching and rubbing, uh, excoriations and lichenification, that is to say thickening and hyperpigmentation of the, of the skin. Where do, the, where do these uh, changes occur? And it, they can occur anywhere on the horse, but most commonly on the face and the trunk. Some of the other places, certainly including the legs have been affected in the past. What's interesting in the horse and is somewhat different than our other domestic species and also different than, uh, than in human beings is that hives or urticaria, uh, these can be associated with atopic dermatitis. And what's even more interesting is that when we look at the number of uh, horses that have atopic dermatitis and have uh, urticaria, they're not all pruritic. Some are and some aren't. So uh, we cannot, we can't look at a horse that has lots of hives and say, well, it's not pruritic. He doesn't have atopic dermatitis. Uh, but that's that. Unfortunately, we can't do that. Now, it's also very common in areas with lots of insect, especially flying insects, uh, that this atopic dermatitis coexists with insect hypersensitivity. And we'll talk about perhaps how to distinguish those and the importance of distinguishing them in just a few minutes. So when we looked at uh, a group, a large group of atopic horses in uh, at the University of California, Davis, what we found is that our mean age of onset was about nine years of age. This is primarily seen, or I shouldn't say primarily seen, I would say the most common, uh, statistically common uh, breed were Arabians, but we saw it in all sorts of horses and we've also seen it in donkeys and mules. Only about 22% of our horses had a seasonality. In other words, only about 22% could we say, okay, the, the owner would say this only happens in the winter or this only happens in the summer. But bear in mind that most of our horses come from about, a, oh, let's say, a 100 mile radius from where we are in the Central Valley of California, where unless you're up in the mountains, we really don't have real seasons. We just have either hot or rain. So, and, and as I was mentioning before, not all of the, uh, the atopic horses had, um, had pruritus. 52% of them had urticaria, 15% had pruritus, and 33% had both. So when you look at that, that means that only about, four, what, that was 48% who were pruritic. Um, so the others were manifested just with uh, pruritus. So just some examples, these are very, uh, uh, these are uh, very mild uh, cases, I'll put on the green arrow there, and uh, we can see a little bit of alopecia around the face uh, and on the muzzle here in this horse, uh, just not, not very dramatic, and the main complaint was that the horse was pruritic, not that the horse had lesions. Um, if we uh, progress to the next slides and we can see here now there's uh, certainly more change uh, in this on this horse's face 
and this is actually a mule here who has alopecia. And all this alopecia, of course, is secondary to the paritis. Um, if we go on to our next photo, um, and uh, of course, we want to uh, disregard this, this large circle here. It's just a, uh, it's a feature of the camera. But again, this horse has some alopecia areas uh, and, uh, and was pruritic, uh, and the alopecia was secondary to that paritis. This horse obviously has a more severe uh, uh, paritis, and we can see all these uh, typical uh, alopecia, ulceration, crusting, uh, and thickening of the skin. And of course, this horse uh, was infamous uh, to the owner as constantly rubbing against anything uh, it could find. Now, um, going on now, uh, what we have, this horse has lots of urticaria. Oops, sorry, I have to go back one. There we go. So this horse has lots of hives, and we can, again, we can see that uh, this is primarily on the trunk and then extending up into the face. So uh, again, this interestingly enough, this horse was not very paritic, which as I mentioned before, is not always the case with uh, atopic horses that have uh, a lot of urticaria. This is another horse, and this horse was shaved for, uh, uh, basically for abdominal ultrasound and surgery, but uh, when they when uh, that was done, we can see lots of urticaria. And again, the source is only mildly paritic. So this this horse has an interesting feature, which has been reported and has been uh, seen a few times. And it has linear urticaria. All these lines here is all urticaria, and some of them are linear. And then uh, um, horizontal, rather, and some of them uh, are horizontal here, and some of them are vertical here. Uh, and again, this is uh, the, the when I've seen this and, and consulted on it, most of the time these are uh, uh, atopic horses. So this is a, a little uh, miniature donkey who was extraordinarily paritic and again had atopic dermatitis. Uh, this is from uh, colleagues at the veterinary school in Massachusetts. And we can uh, again see alopecia, crusting, ulceration um, on legs, a trunk, and on the face. So how do we, how do we diagnose atopic dermatitis? Because uh, what, what I just showed you, all those pictures, as we'll see, for example, in urticaria, there are other differential diagnoses, certainly, for urticaria. And uh, how do we uh, differentiate it from other, other uh, reasons for being paritic, such as uh, various insect bites? Um, so the important thing to realize about atopic dermatitis is it is a diagnosis of exclusion. There's no blood test or skin tests that I can run that will say, yes, this horse has atopic dermatitis. I have to first rule out as best I can other causes for paritis. Now, it certainly helps if there's a seasonal incidence, especially if it's seasonal during the uh, cold weather and we can eliminate uh, uh, insect uh, or arthropod problems that might originate or be worse in the cold weather, such as lice, for example, um, or coreoptic mange or leg mange um, in uh, uh, places that have real seasons and horses are, tend to be bunched together or in confined areas in the cold weather, then those parasites, which are certainly contagious amongst horses, can be more prevalent. And we would have to rule those out before we can say, uh, yes, um, we're, we're dealing with atopic dermatitis. So also we want to say the clinical signs of either paritis or urticaria. Uh, and then in our history, of course, we want to find out what has the owner been treating the horse with? Because every now and then we have a horse that was paritic for some uh, allergic reason, but now the owners are putting things on the horse that are actually making the horse more paritic. So our uh, 
basic part of any history is what are you uh, what have you done so far in an attempt to try to treat this horse uh, for this uh, paritis or for these hives uh, and remember that when people say, for example, let's say you're the second or third veterinarian who has come out to look at a horse, and the people say, well, we, we tried uh, antibiotics, uh, that didn't work. We tried uh, shampoo, that didn't work. Or we tried uh, steroids or antihistamines or um, uh, uh, creams or ointments, and none of those worked. So what does that tell you? it actually tells you nothing because you need to know the doses you need to know which antibiotics or which steroids how long were they given uh, so sometimes it's it's uh, a little more difficult to get that kind of information from owners or uh, from trainers if uh, the owner knows the information and the trainer doesn't or the other way around but history is very important as a way of trying to rule in or rule out uh, atopic dermatitis. So if the owners want to pursue hyposensitization, and in just a minute we'll talk about uh, what if the owners don't want to pursue this, because there is a financial outlay certainly, but if they, if they want to do um, hyposensitization, then the two ways of, of trying to determine which allergens to use, and again, um, these aren't tests that will tell you if the animal is atopic. Rather, their purpose is once you have decided or have theorized or have consulted with the owner and you decide that most likely this horse is an atopic horse, then if the owners want to pursue hyposensitization, these methods are able to determine which uh, allergens one should put in the hyposensitization solution. So we tell owners that hyposensitization will probably cost them, and I'm going to have to think in terms of dollars now, but it'll probably cost them anywhere from $100 to $150 a month. And that's after the testing, whether skin testing or serologic testing that we do, will run them somewhere around $350 to $400. So there's certainly that kind of financial outlay that the people should know going into this. But if, uh, if they do, then the big question is, well, should we use serologic testing or should we, in fact, use um, uh, intradermal skin testing? And uh, a number of years ago, we did a a retrospective study on horses who were tested one way or the other or both and uh, to see what the final outcome was how did those animals do and what we found was there was actually no difference now, they and this will we'll talk about this in a minute but they all had success around 65 to 70 percent of the horses had success, regardless of whether this the allergen test was based on the skin test, the allergen solution rather was based on the skin test or was based on serologic testing. And that didn't seem to make a difference. Now we do have horses that sometimes have nothing on skin tests and have wonderful serologic tests, and we have the reverse where horses have no serologic testing. Uh, no serologic positives, rather, and have very nice intradermal skin testing. It's also important to understand what what uh, medications need to be stopped before one can do one of these tests or the other. So for both of these types of tests, if the owners are interested, they should be off oral or, or uh, injectable steroids, injectable such as dexamethasone, for ideally at least three to four weeks. Uh, if, uh, we're that, if, if we're talking about either of those, intradermal skin testing or serologic testing. On the other hand, uh, for antihistamines, probably the skin test, you only need to be off antihistamines for the horse about two weeks. And for serologic testing, antihistamines shouldn't have any effect. So uh, that's, again, a difference between the two different 
uh, the two different methods. Again, antihistamines are okay for serologic testing. They just have to be stopped at least two weeks prior to intradermal skin testing. So just an example of skin testing. This animal had lots of positives, as, as, uh, we, can, uh, as we can see. But what made me think that this was probably a valid test is in spite of having all these positives, it also had a few negatives, like there. That's not very impressive. There's nothing there. So, so probably this was uh, a, a, uh, a valid skin test. Of course, uh, in order to do a skin test, I usually recommend to uh, clinicians, uh, or I should say to, to general practitioners, um, to not go the route of buying a bunch of allergens. Because unless you are doing a fair amount of skin testing, that is to say, let's say one once a week, um, you're not going to recoup your losses. You're not going to be able to pay back whatever you uh, spent on that. So uh, e for skin testing, it's either to uh, to uh, refer it to an equine uh, a, a veterinary dermatologist who does skin testing, and I know of several in in the uh, in the UK, uh, or to um, to go ahead and, and run the serologic test instead. So again, at, at my university, uh, our, what we found was that um, the most common positive allergens, whether on intradermal testing or on serum testing, uh, were first of all the uh, various dust mites. And and people say, well, how can you have a horse be allergic to house dust mites? Well, there are probably two different, uh, three different reasons. Number one, these mites aren't just in the house. They're rather ubiquitous in the environment. Number two, there's probably cross-reaction between these mites and storage mites and other mites that are living in the, uh, in the barn. And remember, this doesn't mean that these uh, these uh, mites in any way are biting the horse. It's rather their exoskeletons and actually their feces that are coming into contact with the skin of the horse and setting up that, setting off that allergic reaction. The other thing is that it's been shown, and there was actually a nice study in the UK a few years ago, that uh, blankets, unless they're washed and, and uh, dried very thoroughly, uh, particularly uh, helpful would be uh, drying them in the sun, uh, that th these, um, uh, these blankets carry uh, the allergen uh, of uh, the, either the feces or the exoskeleton of these mites. Trees, of course, the different types of trees will depend on where you're where you're living, uh, the geographical area. Bermuda grass, um, people say, well, Bermuda grass must come from Bermuda. Surely it can't be where, where we live. But in fact, Bermuda grass is often used in golf, uh, golf courses. So um, if they're near a golf course. And remember these pollens, pollens can travel 20, 30 miles if there's severe wind. So uh, it's not just like if a, we've had owners been told that their horse is uh, allergic to cedar and alder and they go out and want to chop down the trees in their yard, uh, but you can't chop down all the trees in 50 miles either way. So uh, it's something to, to re remind owners of that. Penicillium is, is a mold. And then Chrysops is, a, is the deer fly. And again, it's not so much that these animals are being bitten by these flies, it's that their exoskeletons become part of the, and their feces become part of the the dust uh, and part of the environment that then contact the horse. So how do we how do we treat these horses? Um, well, if uh, if again if the owners want hyposensitization, what's interesting is 84% of owners thought they saw improvement. Um, but when we, we which was great, owners these owners were obviously. Uh, impressed with a success, but uh, only about, well, just a little under a third of the horses were managed with only hyposensitization, and another um, almost 10% were controlled with hyposensitization and a drug called doxepin, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, now, there is, uh, since that study was done um, a few, more than a few years ago, I think about maybe nine years ago, uh, since that study was done back then, um, uh, there is a new uh, p 
potential method of hyposensitization for people who don't feel like giving their horse injections all the time, although they're subcutaneous and most owners, most horse owners are pretty uh, adept at that. But there are also sublingual drops that are now being man manufactured and available. And our results in horses um, are at least as successful as the injections. And probably what we're going to find is that there are some horses that do well on injections and don't do well on hyposens oral hyposensitization, but we found the reverse already, that some horses who did not do very well on the injections, they, they did not respond, they were still pretty, have done better with the oral hyposensitization. The only problem with the orals is that you have to give them every day, twice a day. And that depending upon the relationship between the owner and the horse, that may be a problem. Whereas the injections are usually every other day for a month and then backed off to once a week or even less if possible. Now, I don't want you to think that every horse owner with an atopic horse comes in to see me and says, yes, I'm all ready to spend $400 dollars uh, and please do all the tests you possibly can and, and you can even charge me in advance for the first couple of months of the allergens. That That is not the case. And so when people, uh, when owners don't want to do that, you know, what, what options we have medically? And what I always try first are antihistamines. Uh, and again, cost-wise, of course, will depend on the what country you're you're practicing in. But the two that I like the best are hydroxazine pamoate and doxepin. Now, actually, technically, doxepin isn't an antihistamine. It's actually a um, an older tricyclic antidepressant, but it has rather uh, uh, rather strong antihistaminic effects in the horse. Doesn't do much in small animals, but it works quite nicely in the horse. So, my feeling on antihistamines is I will try them for let's say 10 days. If there's no response. I'll go on to another one. So I'll, I usually, because we carry hydroxyzine pamoid in our uh, teaching hospitals pharmacy, I'll try that first for for 10 days. And if that doesn't work, I'll, I'll write out a prescription or call in a prescription for the doxepin. There's been uh, an, an, a few uh, st recent studies on cetirizine. Cetirizine is an antihistamine in, in the United States. It's, um, it, it only comes in a, in a very small, uh, uh, five milligram, uh, I'm sorry, 10 milligram tablet, if it's in a large horse, you're going to be just about shoveling in pills. In addition, cetirizine is, is it's only the active ingredient, or the active metabolite rather, of hydroxazine, which again in the US is much easier to dose in the horse. So I rarely use cetirizine. And of course there's prednisolone, we're all familiar with oral prednisolone, um, uh, I will use it long term if nothing else works, but I always tell the owner that this is something that we're going to have to try to get down to the lowest possible every other day dosage in order to uh, avoid any long term side effects. Just a note about another antihistamine which is available in many parts of the world, per perilamine maleate. Uh, it, it, one of its names is trihist. It's also it's often in a hist type of uh, name in granules. This has, even though it's out there for allergies in horses, has very poor bioavailability when given orally. And uh, on the other hand, it's detectable in the urine for up to one week after a single dose. So you're looking probably at long withdrawal times for a product that doesn't really work very well. Another uh, drug that has sometimes been effective is pentoxifiline. Pentoxifiline is, is neither a steroid nor an antihistamine. It's actually a, a methylxanthine derivative. That means it's, it's kind of a second cousin of caffeine. Uh, it has a lot of different, uh, um, a lot of different uh, mechanisms uh, and we're not really sure which one works when we're dealing with atopic dermatitis. Uh, it's not miscible in water, so people sometimes take the, the pills and trying to grind them up and put them in water, and all they're doing is making like this glop that looks like paper mache. So you pretty much, if you're going to grind them up, you put them in like peanut butter or molasses or something like that. It's unusual to see an adverse effect. 
But hyper excitability has been noted. I have had a few horses like that. And when you consider this is a second cousin of caffeine, it's not that surprising. But I think that's pretty rare. There is a granular form of this available in Canada. I don't know if it's available in the UK. It is not available in the United States. Pentoxifiline can take up to a month to kick in. So sometimes if I'm using this, I'll put them on a low dose of prednisolone during that month just to keep the horse and the owner, the horse comfortable and the owner happy until we see how well this works. Topical products are nice to use. They, they get away from the very systemic effects. Uh, Oatmeal-based shampoos or washes are helpful, while the exact mechanism of why oatmeal acts as an antipyritic is not totally understood. It's certainly safe, um, and it's important to remember anytime we're using any kind of shampoo, they have to stay in contact with the skin for at least 10 minutes in order for them to do anything from the standpoint of pruritus. Veerbac uh, has two different corticosteroid sprays. Unfortunately, Genesis does not seem to be available in many countries anymore, but Cordovance certainly is. And Cordovance, which is a type of hydrocortisone, has been shown to be safe and effective in pruritus in the horse. Now, obviously, if the horse is pritic all over, it can become quite ex expensive and rather extensive to use a spray to control that. But if they're just small areas or, or uh, localized areas of pruritus, then cordovance can become uh, a reasonable alternative to using systemic steroids. And there's just some examples, uh, cordovance on the right and Aveno, which is a, uh, a, a oatmeal-based bath. It's on the market for people uh, on the left. Avena is the genus name for oats. So this is a product that I have no experience with. I have to be honest right up front that I have no experience with this because it's not available in the United States. It was launched in the UK. The oral part is niacinamide, which is a B vitamin derivative. And then the gel has an aloe base, and it's marketed for summer itch. So when I, um, when I in the past, have asked uh, UK veterinarians or gone online to see what various chat rooms uh, uh, feel about this, um, some I think it, it seems to work in some horses and not others. I just put it up there. Probably some of you have, well, I'm sure if you have any experience with this, you have more experience than I do with it. And if, if you want to type in something in the question and answer box that says, I've used this, it doesn't work, I use it, it works 20% of the time, or something like that, that would at least increase my knowledge of this product. Uh, this is an interesting product because this is Dermascent. This is a company that uh, is being... Um, uh, is a, a French-based company, and they have uh, mainly their, their deal only with, uh, t well, primarily with topicals. And this is a spot-on. And um, what's interesting, the whole idea behind this is that it can repair some of that barrier function. So it's not really an antipyritic. It would be, I would look at this as an adjunct um, uh, product. Um, we've used it on occasion in horses, um, and it it would in theory help that barrier function come back to normal. Now you think, okay, I have a 500 kilogram horse and I have these little uh, squirt-ons, so how is that possible? Uh, and the, the feeling is in, in in the horse and in other domestic species that uh, with these oils being put on uh, skin that has not been washed as let's say no wash in at least 48 hours, that it, by, by a mechanism called translocation, it spreads along the skin. And, and again, you'd have to follow the directions, and I, I don't want you to think that this is you know, the end all, but it may very well help uh, horses, especially ones that are mild to moderately affected with this, with atopic dermatitis. Well, you you may recall that uh, uh, donkey, uh, the miniature donkey with um, with atopic dermatitis. Now, most of us, including myself, do not use cyclosporin very often in the horse because it's so expensive, at least in the states. But this was a miniature donkey, and the owners seemed not to mind the cost because of how small the animal was. And this is that same uh, uh, donkey. Um, approximately one, uh, uh, sorry, uh, approximately two months after being uh, started on cyclosporin and uh, because of financial reasons was eventually uh, put to every 
uh, three uh, three days and had again you can see a very nice response and most of those uh, ulcerations etc are now gone just a word about food allergies. As I mentioned before, a lot of owners feel that their horses are allergic to various foods. Um, it's actually food allergies in any of our uh, domestic herbivore species, whether ruminant or horses or uh, people raising kangaroos, etc. It's, it's very rare to have food allergies, um, perhaps because uh, uh, plant uh, antigens are just perhaps not as potent or because our um, uh, horses and ruminants because of their digestive tract uh, grind up any allergens pretty easily but for whatever reason there's no good blood tests or skin tests and here I caution you because there are lots of uh, com most companies I, I'm not sure about all of them but most companies offer a blood test for food allergies and I, I just feel very strongly that this is, um, uh, until I see really good scientific work, I, I've said this for years, um, th this is um, a waste of your owner's uh, money and your time. Uh, and some of these uh, blood tests, uh, and here again, I'm talking about blood tests for food allergies, not for atopic dermatitis, which I think is a valid way of, of uh, diagnostics, uh, diagnosing. But for food allergies, it's a waste. And it can be quite expensive. So. Um, even though they're out there, in fact, I mean, I've, um, I don't want to use the word cornered, but when I've uh, asked uh, some of these uh, companies uh, in private, why are they offering blood tests for food allergies when we know that in large numbers of them, they're, they're not IgE mediated, and that's what the blood tests are looking at. Uh, they're oftentimes cell mediated uh, allergies, and um, their response is basically, well, we have to offer it because everybody else is offering it. So just, just to be aware. So really to diagnose a food allergy, we have to use a hypoallergenic diet of some sort. And that basically means a, a, a diet that the, the horse hasn't seen before. So if they're feeding all grass hay, then you might want to switch over to oat hay, something like that. So I can honestly say I've had three uh, you know, I've had four horses in the last 35 years that I really feel were food allergic because we put them on a diet, we changed their diet, and um, they got better, and then they stopped being pruritic, and uh, and then uh, we put them back on their old diet, and they uh, they relapsed. And uh, two of those horses uh, were allergic to alfalfa, and uh, uh, sometimes called lucerne. Uh, and then uh, two of them were allergic to oats, and that's it. So I think it's not, at least in my experience, it's not very common. Um, contact dermatitis, um, medications and home remedies. Uh, people put things on their horse they wouldn't put on their furniture, and so it's always important to ask what they've been uh, putting on. Uh, wood shavings, particularly uh, those that come out of um, exotic woods. So if you have a, an upscale uh, furniture company that's bringing in mahogany or other uh, types of uh, woods, or and and they're selling off the uh, the shavings as uh, as bedding. Um, some of those can become uh, can can institute a contact dermatitis in horses. Um, also, looking for drip marks on the horse, and I'll show you some of that. And progressing lesions, where people have people have for whatever reason they think the horse has an infection or something along those lines, they put some sort of shampoo on it or a cream or an ointment that they had left over from something else or somebody else in the household. And the lesion gets worse, and then the theory, then the, sometimes the owners think, well, they, they don't think it's the product they put on. They feel that whatever the initial reason was is getting worse, and that means we have to put on more ointments. So, uh, and that of course makes it worse. So that kind of progressive lesion history is important. So this is a, a, a case of a horse who has nice uh, drip lesions. Uh, we can. Uh, using the arrow here, and we can see this drip lesion coming down. Uh, that's a, a kind of a, a clue for the veterinarian that uh, this animal has been treated with something uh, that uh, has uh, contributed to a contact allergy. Now, actually, to to be uh, be honest again, and that you, you can't always determine whether it's contact allergy or contact irritant, but to be honest again. 
that doesn't matter really. From a clinical standpoint, you want to determine what is it they're putting on and to stop it. This is uh, uh, on the uh, flank of a horse. Uh, and again, you can see the kind of linear drip mark. Uh, let me get the arrow again. You can see the uh, linear drip marks uh, going uh, uh, down the, uh, the uh, side or the flank of this horse. And, um, and this uh, horse who had pastern dermatitis, and of course, um, uh, Pastern dermatitis is, is it's a whole collection of different product, uh, different diseases that can cause that. Uh, everything from um, uh, uh, bacteria, fungi, vasculitis, uh, allergies. But we'll never know what this horse had, but the owner put a lot of stuff on it. And here's what we have, the thickening and alopecia. And it looks like some sort of orange product, orange color uh, product that was put on. And then uh, this uh, horse that was being treated with some uh, uh, various um, medi medicated shampoos actually in our hospital and developed this uh, very dramatic erythematous response. So, well, how do we treat contact dermatitis? Of course, we want to remove the contactant. We want to use corticosteroids uh, are helpful. I usually go with prednisolone. And that's the product that, that we have available uh, for oral product. I like oral products a little better than injectables because I can stop them uh, quicker and I, but, and I have a little more room as far as management goes. And then pentoxifylene, interestingly enough, pentoxifylene, which works quicker for contact dermatitis than it does with the atopic dermatitis and has been used in uh, a number of different species uh, 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 for the treatment of uh, contact dermatitis. I want to spend a, a few minutes on urticaria because there's so many causes that we have to be uh, uh, thinking of when we see a horse that's got a lot of hives. Arthropod envenomation, which is a fancy way of saying insect bites. Uh, atopic dermatitis, we already talked about. Drug reactions. Occasionally, we'll see dermatophytes that will start off as urticaria, vasculitis, um, purpura hemorrhagica, of course, and then pemphigus foliaceus. So any of these can cause it. In, in my experience, the most common ones are the, the top three, uh, but any of these can, can cause this uh, can cause hives. So here's an example for uh, uh, as a, a horse who has culicoides hypersensitivity, or sometimes they're called noceums. And you can see the the rather um, interesting uh, donut uh, shaped uh, urticaria. And it, it, people used to say that well, if it's a donut shape, it means one thing. If it's just little hives, uh, it means another thing. And I, actually, I don't think that's true. It's you know the, the individual horse can do what it wants when it when it when it uh, when it has hives. This is a horse with drug reaction to phenobutazone. Uh, certainly a common enough uh, product that we use. You can see it's pretty much all over the horse. Very dramatic on the on the neck. Uh, and on the face beginning to cause uh, swelling around the eyes. And of course, now I'm a little worried about this horse, lest the swelling go into the respiratory tract. Luckily, that did not happen. This is another drug reaction, not quite as dramatic, just due to a, a drug, acetazolamide, which the um, ophthalmologists use from time to time. And just highlighting that we can see almost any drug can cause this. So we always want to know if it, what drugs have the, have the owners been giving, especially the more recent. A uh, horse that's been on uh, uh, drug number one for the last three years and then uh, two days ago got drug number two, well, uh, and, that, and then developed hives, is probably drug number two that's the culprit. So it is important to get that kind of a history. So this is uh, when dermatophytes can cause problems. And we can... Um, we can see here that uh, there are hives, where the arrow is, and then we're beginning to get the more typical circular alopecia that we see with dermatophytes. Now, if dermatophytes are going to cause this, they usually, they usually cause the hives, and then within about 48 hours, uh, we can start seeing uh, the uh, the true alopecia that we tend to think of. And as you can see here, we have uh, the 
border, which is hives, and now we're progressing to the more standard alopecia. So when we're called out to look at a horse that has hives and it's had it for, let's say, two or three days, which is pretty common for people to wait until, until to, to call for the vet, um, then, um, you know, if it's high e, I usually don't put this into my differential. But if it's been like 12 hours and they're there, I, I, I kind of at the very least like to pluck some hairs, put them in a, a, a sterile tube and hold on to them um, uh, just in case in the next couple of days the horse develops uh, alopecia and I want to find out if it's a dermatophyte or not. Vasculitis, uh, uh, horses seem to get vasculitis much more than our uh, other domestic species. Uh, this is whether you call this vasculitic urticaria, urticarial vasculitis, and you can, uh, we can see that there's these rather odd shaped lesions, some of them in that donut shape again. Um, there are lots of different reasons for vasculitis, probably 20% of them are idiopathic. They can be due to infections. Uh, purpura hemorrhagica is a necrotizing vasculitis, but when it's not when it's not um, necrotizing, when it's not uh, severe uh, like purpura hemorrhagica, then we have to start thinking about what other uh, what other uh, diseases uh, uh, could this be. And vasculitis, when it's uh, uh, vasculitis, um, uh, oftentimes will respond nicely to pentoxifiline. Um, uh, certainly will respond to corticosteroids too, and again, pentoxifiline does have a bit of a lag phase for this disease, but uh, uh, pentoxifiline is kind of my go-to drug orally uh, for vasculitis of most types, except for purpura hemorrhagica where corticosteroids work uh, very well. Uh, and again, another horse with um, kind of bizarre looking uh, 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 lesions that um, have uh, that are due to vasculitis and uh, urticarial vasculitis. Now, so these uh, urticarial lesions, this is pemphigus foliaceus, and what's happening here is that pemphigus foliaceus, most people, when we think about these um, not very common autoimmune skin diseases, it, it causes uh, crusting and, in fact, has pustules underneath the crust in the epidermis. But in some cases, this process also goes into the hair follicles themselves. And when that happens, uh, then the hairs stick straight up and look a lot like uh, urticaria. The, just like with dermatophytes where you can have the dermatophyte and then it progresses to the more typical alopecia, the pemphigus foliaceus, after a few days, will progress to the more typical crusting as the hair falls out. So again, when I look at uh, urticaria um, uh, in a horse, I'm always looking, I'm always trying to either clip away some of the hair or to um, at least part the hair and see if I see a lot of crust. If I see a lot of crust, I'm beginning to be concerned that this horse could have pemphigus foliaceous. Um, and so uh, just, uh, again, not very common, just like urticaria because of dermatophytes is not very common, but it's certainly something that we have to keep in mind. And then this is one of these bizarre um, linear urticarial horses uh, uh, that I mentioned before, this one being an atopic horse. You know, if any of you who've done a lot of work with small animals know, especially dogs, that one of the reasons, one of the main reasons for having recurrent otitis in the dog is atopic dermatitis. Well, otitis in horses is not very, it seems to be rare or rarely reported. Um, and uh, part of that is, I think, because of the uh, unusual structure of the ear canal. In fact, it's almost impossible, to, 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 it is impossible as far as I'm concerned, to have a really good look at the ear canal with like a video otoscope unless the animal is anesthetized. Um, that horse is just very sensitive about things being stuck in their ear. You think about how often they flick their ears. So causes a, that we can see Otobius magnini, a foreign body, Otobius magnini, the spinos ear tick. Um, neoplasia and then allergies and um, different uh, again uh, different possibilities here probably for allergy atopic dermatitis here's just a horse that had a, a pretty extensive otitis externa and we can see when we did our cytology um, that uh, we have um, 
we have uh, neutrophils and secondary bacteria. And to treat this, we were lucky because this horse was being anesthetized for other reasons. Uh, and so we were, my uh, resident at the time, uh, took some of these, these are called ear wicks. They actually look like cotton. This is after two weeks in the ear and put them into the horse's ear. And we can see here uh, on this picture from the video otoscopy, uh, this area here is actually osseous where the the uh, cartilage stops and it goes right into the uh, to the bone around the ear canal. Very difficult, again, if not impossible to see without a video otoscope. I'm not saying everybody who's listening to me should go out and buy a video otoscope. That's for horses. I'm, I'm not saying that. I just find it interesting that that otitis externa is so rare in in the horse. So. Um, in the next, oh, probably 20, 15 to 20 minutes, we'll just talk about uh, paritis due to parasites, culicoides or noceum. It seems to start um, uh, oftentimes the two to four years of age. There certainly are genetic uh, predispositions. What's happening here is the salivary antigens that the uh, flies or these gnats actually inject into the horse. Uh, they cause an allergic response. You, we, what's interesting is we don't, culicoides don't exist in Iceland itself, but a very small number of horses that have never been out of Iceland have a positive response uh, when looked at immunologically to these antigens, and it's probably because they cross-react with other arthropods. So this is very seasonal in, 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 uh, in our temperate climate zones, including actually California. This is what they look like. This obviously is very much a blown up picture because they're actually very small. Um, clinical signs depend on the species of culicoides. There are lots of different species. Some of them like to feed along the dorsum, some along the ventrum and ventral midline dermatitis, which is sometimes used as a diagnosis. It's really not a diagnosis. It's a uh, it's a reaction pattern, and this is a diffuse pattern, um, uh, not the only uh, um, reason for having a diffuse pattern, but uh, this is a diffuse pattern along the ventral midline. Papules, crusts, ulcers, thickened skin, everything that we would expect from an allergic response. And here we can see, this is a horse uh, from, a pony actually from Sweden. This horse is, this, sorry, this pony has rubbed its, uh, its mane uh, off uh, because of its paritis and in fact has also rubbed its tail as we can see here. Mean and tail, very common places for the dorsal feeding type species of, of uh, culicoides. This is a ventral feeding, this is from California and we can see some crusting and uh, alopecia, uh, lichenification and uh, again a diffuse pattern that is to say it's not blotchy in places, it's pretty much all coalescing. In a more severe case here with this hyperpigmentation and thickening. So what can we do to take care of culicoides? Well, um, permethrin repellents are probably the main thing. We need things that will repel, but the problem with most uh, permethrin repellents is they say, uh, at least in the United States, they say good for a week, good for two weeks. In fact, they're probably not good for much more than two or three days. So oftentimes we have to use them off-label. If the horse is being stalled, fans are really nice, whether it's a, a big kind of mobile fans or overhead fans, because these culicoides are weak flyers. So you start uh, having lots of fans. In fact, the, the kind that are mobile on, on uh, wheels, if you set them up in a stall, the horses will learn to actually face the, the fans. Um, uh, in, in, uh, face into it. Corticosteroids, of course, are very effective to reduce the paritis. I have not been impressed with antihistamines for this. And then so-called dresses or covers, um, uh, which I'll show you an example in a minute. You have to read these labels carefully. For example, this is one. It's got permethrin, and it's 2%. It says I've circled it there. And the next one that I'm going to show you, it says 10%. So you would think, aha, this is better. But in fact, you have to follow the dilutions on this, and it comes out to 2%. This is that same pony with one of these dresses on uh, to keep the, the flies off. 
Other treatments, stabling the horses at sunrise and sunset, because that's when these horses, uh, sorry, that's when these uh, insects like to feed. Using very fine screens, uh, I have it here in per square inch, uh, but very fine screens because, uh, in fact, f finer than mosquito netting. Uh, so if the horses are stalled in their windows and you can put this, and the owners are willing to put these kind of screens on, that helps. Removing standing water because these organisms, these uh, uh, gnats, like to breed in standing water. There is controversy about hyposensitization, uh, and uh, the one of the problems is, is that uh, in the states, it's uh, Culicoides, um, uh, allergen for hyposensitization is very, very expensive if you can find it at all. So I don't have any data on that per se. What I can tell you is in the literature, it seems that if, if you're going to attempt it, if you can get your hands on some Culicoides antigen, uh, allergen, it's probably going to have to be done for uh, six months to a year before you see any change. Which, by the way, for the atopic horses, we usually recommend owners do it for at least six months to a year before deciding if the hypersensitization is working or not. This is the horn fly, hematobia. This cause, you can see there's just lots of horn flies on this horse. And if you have a white horse, then they're easier to see, I think. Um, these, and notice how they're both in the ventral, uh, ventral aspect, both these photos. And um, what they do is they, they cause these patchy areas, the focal areas of uh, alopecia, uh, as opposed, uh, uh, or I should say, focal areas of dermatitis, which uh, that's as opposed to the culicoides, which has that more diffuse look. Uh, stable flies to mix as calcitrans, um, a big problem. Uh, as you can imagine, again, in, in warm weather, stable flies like the front half of the animal. They like, uh, Stamixis uh, likes the, the front legs. Uh, it likes the, uh, uh, what I've called the brisket. Um, and here you can see again, and even the, the uh, um, intermandibular um, and uh, cheek areas, uh, as you can see in this horse. I uh, hear a bunch of these flies uh, around a, a wound. Probably, actually, it's probably a sarcoid. Just to show you these, like I said, these flies are small, but here's just an example of the stomachs of a stable fly on the left and hematobia on the right. And a black fly, black flies cause problems, especially black flies like running water, so uh, streams. Uh, are especially uh, a favorite place for them in the spring. Um, here's a picture of a bunch of uh, these flies um, going after the, the inner pinna of a horse. Uh, Close-up view uh, of this organism. Oops, let's move the arrow where it's supposed to be, right there. Um, and here we have a horse who was so pyritic from uh, probably a combination of these different flies that you can see it's putting itself right over the branches of this uh, small tree and scratching back and forth. Uh, this is just a, a huge uh, deer fly on the horse and of course the, the requisite uh, unpleasant looking horse fly on a person and a mosquito also on a person. So it's important uh, to remember that while culicoides like standing water, uh, and again, uh, the um, black flies like running water, uh, hematobia and stomixis like manure and decaying vegetables, uh, vegetation rather. Um, and so all these have their different requirements, um, which, um, which is important when we're trying to um, uh, advise owners as to how to proceed and how to protect their horses. And they also have different feeding times. The, the horn and stable fly, the hematobia and stomixis like the daytime, as does the deer flies, horse flies. Um, 
the uh, Kilocoides, especially like twilight to dawn, simulants, the, the black flies like morning and evening, uh, etc. Et so uh, they, they really do a good tag team basis. Uh, it's like a relay race because there's always going to be flies around. So it kind of depends what's most, lo most common in your area as to how you're going to try to advise the owners. Uh, fly predators uh, is interesting. These are little wasps that, I mean, they're really little, and they um, they don't harm animals or people, but they feed on the fly larva. And so you can, it, 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 actually, they're available as these, as their eggs, and they, you, you kind of spread them all over the manure, and they'll go after the stomixis, uh, and they'll go after house flies, um, but um, they don't do anything for Kilocoides, because remember, Kilocoides aren't in the manure, where are they? They're in the, the water. They won't do anything for black flies because, again, they're primarily in the water when, as far as their larvae are concerned. Coreoptes are so-called uh, leg mange, uh, pasterns, fetlocks, ventral midline. This is a differential, certainly, for pastern dermatitis. It's not the only one, but uh, from our standpoint as uh, for pruritus, uh, certainly is a, 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 a something to consider. It will vary as to your geographic location as to how often you see this. We see this on, on, from time to time. And we're actually seeing uh, this more in some of our camelids, uh, llamas and alpacas. Um, and uh, draft breeds certainly are uh, predisposed. It doesn't mean you can't see a quarter horse with this, but it's relatively uncommon. And this is what it looks like. Uh, as you might expect, there's lots of erythema and crusting and this area, uh, the, um, the area uh, on uh, this uh, foot has been shaved so that we can better appreciate the hyperpigmentation, thickening, and, and erythema. Uh, more severe case, uh, I think here showing uh, also um, the, not only the, uh, the alopecia, but the hyperpigmentation and, and uh, uh, both on the pastern and as we get uh, closer in the fetlock as well. Uh, more severe case, um, this uh, from a colleague here in, in France, um, and uh, thickening, uh, and really dramatic thickening uh, in this horse. And if we uh, take a closer look, now there's a, a secondary problem because of the thickening uh, and the exudation. What we're having here are maggots uh, coming out from the flies, obviously uh, laying their eggs there. Uh, this is a severe case in a donkey. Uh, it had pretty much generalized uh, lesions from Coryoptes. Um, we can see uh, on the... Uh, on the uh, neck, shoulders, going down into the leg, and of course this, the thickening uh, hyperpigmentation uh, due to chronic pruritus from this organism. So diagnosis is by superficial scraping, but this isn't always an easy mite to find. Not as hard as, say, scabies, but, but uh, it, it, sometimes it can be quite difficult to find this organism. So multiple scrapings may be needed. Uh, and when when I do scrapings, I don't do I don't use a scalpel blade anymore, especially on horses, because all they have to do is move, and now you've cut the horse, uh, which is not very good for public relations with the owner. So I use this. This is a medical grade spatula, and it's available from Fisher Brand micro spatulas. They have a couple of different uh, types of micro spatulas, and you want to use the ones that have a flat blade. Don't get the ones that look like little spoons. You might think, oh, this is great. I can scoop up more of the stuff. But it's actually, once you scoop it in, it's hard to get it out. So you want a, a, one of these flat-ended blades. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't get any, I mean, I'm putting up the Fisher Scientific Catalog number, but I don't get any money from Fisher Scientific or, uh, or actually any of the products that I've talked about uh, today. So just, just to let you know. But this is very handy, and these spatulas last forever. Uh, my one of my uh, technicians has uh, what you would call a, a nurse, uh, animal nurse here. One of my technicians uh, has the same one for the last uh, almost 20 years. So they 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 uh, they're, it's quite a decent investment. I think they're like 12 U.S. dollars a piece. 
anyway, the, so here we have this organism, the Coryoptes, and um, here, here are the, here's the eggs. Uh, here's a female with an egg inside of them, uh, and this is how the eggs get there because obviously these organisms are mating. Um, it's, not, it's unusual to see this many on one scraping we, we did on, on one draft horse, so of course we took a lot of pictures. Um, what's uh, interesting is on some biopsies you can find them as well. Um, not always. It tells you you probably should have and more skin scrapings, but we can see these mites here on histopathology way up in the stratum corneum. They don't burrow. They're just, uh, they don't burrow into the epidermis. They're just up in the stratum corneum. So how do we treat these? There's a number of different treatments, and probably one of the most important things is to remember is that none of these treatments work all the time. And that if you're going to treat a horse with Coryoptes and they're exposed to other horses, almost inevitably the other horses have them. They may not have the mites to the same population level that they're showing clinical signs, but they have to be treated. So whether you want to use one of the ivermectins or avermectins, uh, ivermectin, moxidectin, doramectin, all these are, are uh, certainly out there. Uh, whether you want to use those, um, uh, we'll oftentimes use one of those in combination with lime sulfur, uh, uh, which is available um, from DECRA. Uh, and that's a topical. It smells like rotting eggs, but it does seem to have a great deal of uh, 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 anti-parasitic properties. Probably have to use it at least twice a week for six weeks. It's important to remember that nothing, whether you're using lime sulfur or the avermectins or if you're using the frontline spray, which is rather expensive because you, you have to use practically one bottle per leg. But um, regardless of what you're using, nothing kills the eggs. So you're going to have to repeat. So if you're going to use uh, one of the avermectins, you should at least repeat it once and ideally twice on a monthly basis or every two week basis because you have to wait until those eggs hatch and then you can kill the uh, immature forms. It just shows you frontline and lime, lime plus. At least the Decra product also has a picture of a horse on it which is always, uh, as you can see, it's it's always a, a helpful thing for owners to, to see. Um, so, uh, so as I said before, ventral midline dermatitis, we have uh, a number of different differentials, culicoides, uh, black flies, a simulidium, and the oncocerca, which oncocerca, because of the advent of avermectins, is, at least in the United States, practically a vanished species. And then focal horn fly, and in really severe cases, Coryoptes, when they start at the legs and just keep on going up the, into the trunk of the body, they can cause a, a, a severe ventral midline dermatitis. Lice, uh, we know that lice causes problems. Um, biting lice, there's two different species, sucking lice. Uh, sucking lice tend to uh, stay in one place, the biting lice tend to scamper around. Uh, this is primarily seen in horses either confined, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when, uh, uh, particularly in the winter when they're uh, uh, pushed together, um, uh, poor sanitation, and the hallmark is pruritus once the population of the lice get to a certain point. And this is just an example of the, the biting lice, uh, Wernicchia equii, uh, we're, sorry, we're Nichelia equi, uh, and Hematopinus asini, with a sucking louse with a kind of longer straw-like mouth part. And here is very typical of this horse turning around and trying to bite at, at, at the lice. Um, you can, we can see some of the lice nits. And by the way, it's always a good idea um, to to invest in a, a magnifying lens of some sort because um, you'll be able to see things. Not only will you be able to see things better um, by um, uh, by using uh, a, a magnifying lens, but you'll also impress owners because they'll feel like everybody else looked at my horse, but you really looked at my horse. And so the magnifying lens, you can buy a pretty decent one for not much money, but you all probably have one in your practice. It's your otoscope. Just take the cone off. Right? You have a light source, you have a magnifying lens, 
Perfect. Even if, even if at the beginning, it'll just make you think this is just making what I don't know a little bigger. Uh, eventually, you'll get rather adept at, for example, finding lice knits, uh, finding papules that have hair shafts sticking out of them. So if you have a rash, there's a lot of things that can cause a rash on an animal. But if you have hair shafts sticking out of that rash, then that pretty much cones it back down to some sort of infectious process, either uh, usually in the horse, it's bacteria or dermatophytes, um, or um, uh, occasionally it's rain scald will do that. Uh, the dermatophilus will sometimes do that. Um, and just another uh, uh, example of a donkey turning around and trying to bite itself and having alopecia on its back end. Um, there is a lice, a nice picture of lice. And how do we treat lice? Almost anything that we said will treat um, the uh, uh, the um, uh, various uh, other, uh, cor like coreoptes. Almost anything that kills coreoptes will usually kill lice. And lice, um, uh, while they are contagious, they tend to be rather easy to kill. Again, nothing kills the eggs. So you have to uh, repeat things uh, at, at least uh, two to three times, whether you're using an avermectin or a spray or lime sulfur. Um, Trombiculodiasis uh, uh, trim or chiggers, uh, this is something that's usually seen in the autumn months uh, along hedgerows, horses that are um, that are uh, 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 ridden out in the country are obviously more likely to get this. Um, this is the the it's actually the larval mite that's the parasite. So it's even though it's a mite, you only find six legs on it as opposed to the eight legs that adult mites have. Um, but the adult is is a vegetation parasite. And it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, variably paritic, um, usually on the face and neck. But the problem is these guys oftentimes will take their meal uh, and then drop off. And so the animals can be very paritic, um, but if they take two days or so for the owners to, to let you come out and take a look, uh, sometimes the, the organism is gone. When, when it is around, they're usually uh, anywhere from a brown, red, or orange uh, color. This horse looks kind of uh, not a very nice uh, hair coat, especially along the face and the neck. And the horses will get this either on the face and neck as they bend down to eat the grass or the pasture or what have you, or they'll get it on the legs uh, where they're walking through the, the uh, vegetation that's uh, afflicted with this. Um, and there's, there's the organism again. There, these are uh, six um, six-legged mite larva. There's a nice orange one as an example of uh, how they look color-wise. And um, again, almost anything will kill these guys. Uh, lime sulfur, uh, permethrin, ivermectin, um, usually will, any of these will work well. Um, and since they don't lay their eggs on the horse, you don't have to worry about repeating it, really. I mean, it's a good, the reason for repeating it is so, especially if you're using permethrin, so it's a repellent, uh, and you can kill them as they continue to, uh, new ones infest the horse, but you don't have to worry about their eggs. And then finally, we come to pinworms, pinworms, which, um, uh, the problem is the problem that they cause with paritis around the perineal area is that the eggs that um, the females lay they're cemented by this gelatinous material, which is highly irritating. So this is a, a differential for tail rubbing. It's certainly not the only one, and usually we uh, these respond extremely well to being treated with any number of products. And with the advent of the avermectins and ivermectin, uh, this is I think becoming less and less common. Uh, sometimes people think that their kids got pinworms from the horse. Pinworms are very specific. Sometimes people think their kids got pinworms from the dogs and cats. And dogs and cats don't get pinworms. It's just you know these things are implanted. I think in the in the popular literature. And here's a horse who is tail rubbing. There are some pinworms uh, and there's the egg. Um, so differential diagnosis of tail rubbing, pinworms certainly. Culicoides will sometimes cause, uh, to, as we saw, a tail rubbing. Uh, atopic dermatitis 
uh, although usually that's also in combination with uh, being pruritic in other parts of the of the body. Malassezia dermatitis, malassezia is a yeast, and in some cases in mares, that will set up a pruritic response between the mammary glands. And the only way the mares seem to be able to get any kind of relief is to back up against things and rub. And of course, what happens is they become tail rubbers. And in theory, food allergy would be like this, but that's pretty unusual. So this concludes um, the things that I'm, I have uh, as far as lecture goes. I hope that some of this was interesting or helpful or, or both. Um, I'm uh, happy to uh, try to uh, answer uh, any questions. There's a, uh, there is a comment that uh, says that, I think this is talking about Kabbalists, um, and the veterinarian says um, that, uh, quote, I quite like it if given early enough in the season. Um, and uh, which I, I think that uh, unless, uh, unless they're already pruritic. So um, it would be, it sounds like it's something that one uses if you have a horse that um, you have a high suspicion in previous seasons has had this problem or perhaps has a, a, a it's a uh, mayor or, or the stallion or a, or a sibling or half sibling rather which, uh, has this problem um, that it, it's a, it's a kind of a preventative. So that's, that's good to know. And I, I thank the veterinarian for that comment. Um, that's the only question or comment that's up there. So I, uh, again, I, I do want to thank everyone for their attention. Uh, it's, uh, it's been an honor talking to everyone. On behalf of Webinar Club, I'd like to thank Professor White for an excellent webinar today. The recording and the certificate of attendance for this webinar will be available in the next few days and we will email you as soon as they are ready. Thank you all for attending. That's the end of the webinar.